Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Danette Howard, and I am Senior Vice President and Chief Strategy Officer at Lumina Foundation. Lumina is an independent private foundation committed to making opportunities for learning beyond high school available to all. We are incredibly excited for this important conversation today, which will focus on HBCU leadership perspectives. perspectives. And before we get started, I'd like to welcome the 350 participants who have taken some time out of their busy schedules to join us for this webcast. We're eager to have you fully participate and engage and to hear your feedback and answer your questions. Please write your comments and questions in the Q&A field at the bottom of your screen. We'll be able to directly address some of these questions later on during the session. And please feel free to join us in the Twitter conversation by using the hashtag HBCU Leaders. The webinar will also be recorded and posted online at www.luminafoundation.org. And now for the main event. It is my pleasure to introduce our three incredible presidents that will be joining us for today's conversation. I will introduce them in the order that they appear on my computer screen. First, we have Dr. Wayne Frederick, president of Howard University. Welcome, Dr. Frederick. Thank you. Next, Dr. David Wilson, president of Morgan State University. Welcome to you, Dr. Wilson. Thank you, Dr. Howard. And finally, Dr. Walter Kimbrough, president of Dillard University. Welcome to you as well, Dr. Thank you. Kimbrough. Good afternoon, thank you. So we are here today to discuss uh, the HBCU Student Success Initiative, a grant-funded opportunity that was supported by Lumina Foundation and that we started four years ago back in 2016. Uh, your three institutions were a number that we considered for this opportunity and through a pretty rigorous process uh, finalized that your three would be the institutions in which we would make some significant investments. So for the first question, I'd like you to think back to when we launched this effort back in 2016 and you and your project leadership teams joined us here in Indianapolis for the project launch. What were you focusing on in terms of student success at that time? Uh, what kind of specific interventions did you have in place to increase student retention and graduation rates? And then can you speak a little bit about some of the strategies and interventions that you've implemented six, since that time that have contributed to significant progress in your overall student success rates. Uh, and again, I'll start with you, Dr. Frederick, then Dr. Wilson and Dr. Kimbrough, I'd ask you to answer the same question. Sure, thank you. Um, you know, we, when we were approached by you, we had already started an Office of Undergraduate Studies that hadn't existed at Howard previously. And that office um, was focused on uh, advising. We had set up a, a pretty rigorous and robust um, advising um, activity through that area. What One of the things I discovered is that uh, while we were trying to get our graduation rates up, uh, quite a few students had actually attempted, and in some cases even earned more credits than they needed for graduation, but did not fulfill the specific requirements for graduation. And I felt that that was partly because of advising. So that's one of the things that we did. We had purchased a software, DegreeWorks, to also help with that process so that when students did um, register, they kind of got off track and would alert, it had an alert system that would then bring them to an advisor. Since um, start launching the program uh, with Lumina, one, one of the things that we've done is had, we've had a sophomore orientation. When we talk a lot about freshman retention, but what we I think we're not seeing, I had a blind spot, so it was the fact that sophomores were at risk if they weren't oriented to what was like. You know, the excitement of coming out of high school and coming in as a freshman, but in your sophomore year, you really want students to be focused and buckle down, and especially if they have an if they are decided about what they want to do or they want to make a switch, et cetera, 
they really need resources to make sure they can do that. And so having that sophomore orientation as an example has been a significant boost for us uh, since we started that program. Uh, first of all, I want to really thank the Lumina Foundation for investing in Morgan, uh, in Howard, and in Dillard uh, in this space of uh, student success. And for us, uh, that investment has made a tremendous difference uh, in driving our graduation rates uh, and driving our retention rates. Uh, as I reflect on 2016, when indeed uh, Dr. Howard, the Lumina Foundation, uh, had the convening there uh, with the three of us and our teams. Uh, that was really an inflection point for us in so many ways. Um, where we were here at Morgan, um, we were already down this path uh, of upholding student success as our number one priority. Uh, and if you go online and look at our strategic plan, you'll see enhancing student success is priority number one. Um, and um, along that path, uh, we had done uh, several things. Uh, number one, uh, we had begun to introduce technology uh, into the way in which we were enhancing um, the way students uh, were being notified that they were not doing what they were supposed to do. Uh, and so uh, we got a grant uh, and we introduced Starfish uh, to our faculty. The faculty really adopted this technology very well. Uh, and for students who did not show up to class, uh, they would uh, get a text saying, David, where are you? We missed you today, right? Uh, as a matter of fact, I felt lonely that I didn't get a text. Um, but um, uh, that was the first, and so we had really, really done some great work in that space in terms of the early adopter of that technology. Um, and then, um, I believe, Dr. Harvey, you perhaps were in Maryland during this time as the Secretary of Higher Education, uh, when the state legislature looked at um, the average number of credits uh, that students across public institutions in Maryland uh, were taking to get their degrees. And I was in the legislature, I went down for my legislative hearing, and quite frankly, I was embarrassed because Morgan was number one. It was like an average of 132 credits. Uh, and so we came back and the first thing we did was, was that we got to bring these credits down to 120. Uh, and we really put together a great team. Our faculty worked with us extraordinarily well, and we did that. Um, and then um, we had begun to see an increase in our retention rate, an increase in our graduation rate. Um, and at that point, um, uh, we looked in on uh, institutions across the country that we wanted to model uh, and partner with. And that is really when we uh, paid some attention to what was happening at Georgia State. Uh, and then I invited um, uh, the Georgia State team up to Morgan. Uh, we had a day-long retreat. Over 90 of our colleagues, all of the vice presidents, all the deans, all the associate deans, all the academic department chairs, and what Georgia State did was basically just told us, here's how we increase retention and graduation rates. And so following that, uh, I established a 50 by 25 initiative here. Uh, because when I came here, the graduation rate was 29%, and we were aspiring to 50% by 2025. But we are now at 46%, uh, percent. and so we are very close to that mark. Um, and then finally, uh, we um, started a new completers, a near completers program, uh, where um, we looked at the number of students that had started at Morgan, and they left without getting their degree but they had completed 90 credits and they were still within the six year window. And so our vice president for enrollment management and her team brought forth this concept where all we had to do was make a minimal investment. And all she asked for was like $50,000 to go after these students. And we did by giving each of the students an opportunity to get a $2,000 grant. Several of them raised their hands to come back. We ended up graduating about 11 or 12 of those students in that same year. And that raised our graduation rate here by one percentage point. And then everybody got excited. And then Lumina, um, I think uh, for us, um, it, it, it gave us the, the kind of validity uh, mm -hmm. to say, look, these strategies that you're employing right now um, you can really scale them up 
uh, right. then you can have the resources to go a bit farther with regard to the technology. And so yeah. we have acquired EAB, we're using those analytics and, and we have, you know, we're using degree works and a lot of really uh, uh, fantastic technologists now uh, to help us in this space and they are paying great dividends. That's great, Dr. Wilson, thank you. I'm going to turn to Dr. Kimbro to answer that same question. All right, thank you. Um, I arrived here at Dillard in 2012, and so we are at that point in time, seven years removed from Hurricane Katrina, but the impact was still very visible. Um, we still didn't have the full use of all of our residence halls on campus. Only one, well, really two properties were available in a couple of places off campus. And for a campus like ours, which is a uh, very much traditional residential based institution that played into some of the challenges in terms of uh, retention and ultimately graduation. Um, we didn't finish uh, renovating all of our residence halls until January of 2014. So that was part of the challenge that we, we were dealing with. And also you think about around that time, 2012 through 14, there were the changes in the Parent PLUS loan program. And so you, you start to layer those things on there. It, it really created some challenges in terms of where our retention and graduation rates had historically been and then where they were at that point in time. So leading up to 2016, one of the first things we did, and very similar to what Dr. Wilson talked about, we looked at some things at Georgia State. Uh, I'm a native of Atlanta, did my PhD at Georgia State and uh, directed orientation there. Um, we looked at the, the retention grants that they did and, and based on some research that was done here right before I came, the number one reason that Dillard students did not return was the amount of unmet financial need. So we created a grant program to really close that gap. And so that started to move us in the right direction in terms of retention and graduation rates. So by the time we got to 2016, it was like, how then do we continue to build on this? And then using the, the data analytics, it helped us to sort of figure out what kinds of other supports can we put in place in terms of tracking and following up with students, the appointment process we use to deal with students, in terms of ensuring that students are you know, completing 15 hours per semester. Those are the kinds of things we start to add. So this gave us a way to systematically track those kind of initiatives to then layer on top of the work we were doing with our what we call the safe grant to provide those grants. And that helped us to really raise our retention and, and graduation rates as well. So, in that time, retention rate went up over 14 points. It's pulled back some now, and some of that's still related to some of these changes. Uh, we were a Perkins loan school, so when you lose Perkins loan, for us, that was a million dollars a year that we can't provide. So I see some slippage due to that, um, but Perkins loan program was part of that that impacted us. But anyway, we still went up about 14 points and still in that range. And overall uh, graduation rate, I haven't seen all of our 2020 numbers yet, but it's really right at about 50% now, which is where we want to be as well. Uh, so we've seen a lot of progress. So we just layered several best practices together um, to, to really keep you know, moving the, the needle forward. And so now, you know, going forward is you try to figure out what's going to happen now when you start to factor in a pandemic and a recession. So uh, it, it, what we've done is great, but I don't know how it, and how we have to shift based on our new reality. So that's yeah. what we're doing. Yes, and we're definitely going to get to that question, uh, Dr. Kimbrough, uh, because I'd really love to hear some of the implications for sustainability, given where we find ourselves at this moment in time. But before we get there, there I heard a couple of common themes in each of your answers. Uh, first of all, uh, this grant was not the start of your work and your focus on student success. And I think that we should make that very clear. It did give you the opportunity to build upon some of the great uh, efforts and initiatives that you had already put in place and also to perhaps try some uh, new and different strategies as well. Um, you've spoken to the importance of technology and the predictive analytics platform, and so we'll talk a little bit more about that. And I heard that there is not one single thing that you've done. You know, oftentimes people spend uh, energy looking for that silver bullet. What is that one thing that is going to add jet fuel to my student success efforts? And the reality is it's not a single thing. There is an integration of efforts that have to be embedded across the campus. And I think the work that you've done is certainly reflective of that. 
I'd like to ask you about um, one of the specific uh, requirements for this project, which was not simply to focus on student success overall and for all of your students, but to identify a specific population that you really wanted to try to uh, see some considerable uh, improvements with. And uh, we did not dictate what that population should be, but ask you to look at your data, have some conversations with your colleagues, and then to identify that population. Uh, Dr. Frederick uh, and Dr. Wilson, your campuses selected Pell eligible students. Dr. Kimbrough, you were uh, an overachiever and, and selected three populations, uh, students who had less than 2.0 GPA after their first semester, first generation students, and students who had unmet financial need uh, of $4,000 or greater. So I would ask each of you to talk about your selection of that specific population, uh, the progress that you've seen relative to that specific population, and if you've experienced any challenges. Um, Dr. Frederick, I'll start with you. Dr. Kimbrough, then Dr. Wilson, please. Sure. Um, well, on the Pell Grant eligible students, we had really started focusing on them because one of the things I observed was that unmet need was an issue and having a private institution with a 45% Pell Grant eligibility um, rate in the undergrad campus was problematic and, and part of the contributing factor to trying to move that graduation rate needle. So we focus on that group because we had started, our board had agreed um, for me to in institute what I call an unfunded mandate where we started a grace grant. Any student that did not have any unmet need for a student with an expected family contribution of zero, the board agreed to completely um, fill their financial aid package and, and cover all of their unmet need. And what we immediately saw was a rise in our in our graduation rate. And as we wrapped all the other things from the student success project around that we uh, got from the Lumina grant, we have now closed the gap between, we, 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 last year we closed the gap between our Pell Grant and non-Pell Grant population to 1% uh, difference in the graduation rate. And I think that that's a, a big you know, testament that if these students, if you take away their biggest issue, which is their need, uh, they really perform extremely well. For us, uh, ours were really selected, as I indicated earlier, based on a research study that was done here before I started, uh, December of 2011, where we identified the, the top factors by which dealer students didn't return. As I indicated, number one was unmet financial need. Number two was the, the number of credits a student or the, the average GPA a student completed after their first semester. So if a student averaged less than a 2.0, their first semester, their six year graduation rate was less than 7%. So we knew that was a problem area. So we focused on the unmet financial need, as well as trying to make sure that students were completing 15 credits at least per semester, that kind of work. And so in all those categories for the three areas, including first generation students, we were able to see an increase. The largest increase was getting the students to do at least complete at least 15 hours. And so some of that was a lot of the social marketing to talk about, you know, 15 hours a semester, um, Complete College America does a lot of that work, sort of partner with them to really keep talking about 15 hours and, and then using the systems in place to monitor students if they're dropping out, what a midterm grade is looking like, so we can pay more attention to that to reduce that number so those students would graduate and have a higher retention rate, which we saw as well. Um, as I indicated, we had some additional funding that we're using, private dollars, which would really help to target the students with the, the great financial need if they had an unmet financial need of $4,000 or greater. So they got the benefit of really focusing on completing 15 hours a semester plus the additional financial um, incentives as well. So those are the ways we layered it, but it was based on an initial study that was done here in 2011. And we pulled those three areas out to say, if we can really focus to make sure they're completing the 15 hours and um, we can support uh, with any additional financial support, we could see an increase in retention, which we did. Um, for all three of those categories. Um, and I just, I was looking at some of the data, the, the number of students has steadily declined that are earning less than a 2.0 their first semester at Dillard. It's gone down significantly. So we're really pleased about that because that pretends well for them to finish in four to six years. So uh, at Morgan, it's kind of helpful to understand the demographics of our population. So uh, we have about 8,000 students 
uh, 90% of those students receive financial aid. Uh, and about 56% of them are Pell eligible, and about 30% receive the maximum Pell. And so for us, uh, we just could not see how you could not focus on students where 50% of your student population is Pell eligible. Uh, now, early on in this process, um, I, 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 I very much believe in data, uh, and I believe that you have to used to data uh, in order to inform your decisions. Uh, and so when I look at one of our cohorts uh, in 2011 and look at the retention rate in 2012, um, we uh, lost, I guess, about 30% oh, of those students. Uh, and I wanted to know, well, why didn't they come back? And so I asked uh, our uh, vice president for institutional advancement to conduct a study on those 30% it was about 350 students or so that did not come back. Because I wanted the real data, I wanted to know. Uh, and so uh, about 35% of those students uh, were actually uh, making meaningful academic progress. Uh, they had very, very impressive grade point averages, but the number one reason they did not return was because they did not have the money. Uh, and so that would have been roughly about 100 or so students. And when I would take 100 students and then put them with the 70% that return, I basically said once again to the legislature, well, guess what? My retention rate uh, is right where our counterparts are in Maryland. Uh, and so it was the lack of resources that prevented Morgan from having the same retention rate as a College Park or UMBC or a Towson. And so therefore, this was kind of natural for us to look at. Now, um, when you look at the students at Morgan who qualify for the Pell Grant, on an annual basis, we're getting somewhere between 15 to $16 million from the Pell Grant program. We are bringing to the table about 16.5 million of institutional dollars not state, I mean, this is, this is money that will come into our operating budget that we are redirecting to financial aid. And so the takeaway here is that we can't just rely upon the Pell Grant program as much as we want it increased, as much as we want it doubled uh, to lead us to the promised land. Uh, if this is a top priority of an institution, and it is at Morgan, uh, then we have to come to the table with our own dollars, and we are doing that in a way that exceeds what we're getting from the federal program. And so when we put all of this on the table and Dr. Kara Turner is our vice president from Roman Management Student Success, Dr. Tiffany Pume, our associate vice president, the entire team there, they have been modeling, uh, how do you actually take the $16 million uh, and distribute it amongst the Pell eligible students and the need-based students in such a way that is almost just in time. How, how do you do that across the four years where you're not just loading it up in the freshman year and then taking it away in the junior and senior year? Uh, and so as we've done all of that, it is really because of that that we have a 46% graduation rate, that we've been able to increase our graduation rate by 60%. And when you look at those gaps, there's not a huge gap there because we have invested in those students in terms of both the financial resources they need and then what the Lumina uh, initiative has done is that it has enabled us uh, to put in place what, what we call some bridges to the future. And, and we have experimented with these, these bridges and several of them are working. And so we have already made a commitment here at Morgan of that we are not disinvesting in those bridges that are working. And so I guess uh, the point that I'm making, Dr. Howard, is that uh, we have seen that gap close uh, and we have used institutional dollars uh, to um, augment um, the federal dollars and the grant dollars that we are getting. Uh, and there's no way with that kind of success uh, that an institution or can or should walk away from it. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. You've alluded to a number of things that I'd like to follow up on. 
including the ROI on the investment that each of your institutions have made. But I'd like to start by speaking a little bit more about some of the outcomes that uh, you've each achieved over a relatively short period of time. And I am in no way suggesting that these outcomes are because of the Lumina investment, but perhaps they are in part due to some of the changes that you made as a result of that investment, along with all of the other work that you and your teams have been doing. So Dr. Kimbra, I'd like to start with you. Uh, you mentioned that your six-year completion rate um, you mentioned your retention and success rates, but specifically your six-year completion rates gone up by nearly 14 percentage points. And it looks like some of this work has been especially meaningful for first-generation students on Dillard's campus. So can you speak to what has been the biggest change on your campus that you believe has led to this astounding uh, increase in student success? Was it a cultural change? Was it a technological change? Was it um, kind of a broad-based effort? Can you just give us some uh, sense of that? And then if you could just point to one ongoing challenge that you are still trying to get a handle on. Well, in terms of uh, the shift, I think just using the technology and embracing, you know, as, as Morgan is using, we're also using EAB. So people to really lean into that, that platform and, and really embrace the technology, um, which I mean, we're now in an environment where people are embracing even more and more technology. So uh, I, I think that sort of helped us, but it, that, that took a, a while, a process to do that, but it made things, I believe, very um, transparent for everyone to be able to use that data and see and, and manipulate it in such a way that helped particularly faculty members and then staff in our um, um, academic success uh, office to be able to really uh, provide advising for our students. So I think that, that that has been transformative as a part of the work that um, we continue to do at Dillard University. So that's that's the main thing. And then you also asked about the one, ask, say that again, that was a hard question, which I tried to forget because it was hard. <laughs> yes, I'd say, what, what do you think is the um, single greatest challenge that continues to uh, maybe inhibit the progress that you'd like to make relative to student success? In light of all the great progress, yeah. what's the single biggest challenge remaining? So I, I think that the challenge is, um, the analogy I, I use a lot is, uh, it's like, well, I'll, I'll say the whiz. Um, we can have all the analytics. You can lay out the path and tell students, follow the yellow brick road, ease on down the road, and people still go off into poppy fields. And that impacts your retention and graduation rate. So you can have all the things in place. You can have the staff involved, the advising, and then someone decides, oh, I want to do this, and they go off into poppy fields. And they don't get back on the yellow brick road. And so you have the challenge. So that's, that's part of the challenge sometimes that, you know, we can't, you can't just force people to do, you know, what you think they should do. And that's a part of the process too, that I think we have to be comfortable with to say, people will explore their learning their own ways. And I think we have to be okay with some of that. But when you're just looking and you're saying, well, why aren't the numbers going a certain way all of the time? You can get a certain group that comes in with a different spirit and decide to do things differently. And it might not be that you've done something wrong. It's just that people have decided to do things in a different kind of way. So I think that's going to always be an ongoing challenge because those things will impact you as well as life situations. We're, you know, 80% Pell Grant eligible. So the, the smallest thing can impact a student who has great promise. It has nothing to do with Dillard University. It could be something that happens with a family member uh, or their entire family that changes their circumstances where they cannot continue to go in school. Even if you provide additional funding or support, they can't remain in school. So those would be the things that I, those un, the things that we cannot control will always be there. Particularly when you serve a high needs population, there's a greater chance that those things will impact the work that you do. Thanks, Dr. Kimbrough. Uh, Dr. Wilson, you've already spoken to some of the outcomes that you've achieved at Morgan. And so I'd like for you to just briefly um, touch once again on uh, the increase in both the four and six year graduation rates, specifically for your Pell eligible students. And can you speak to the role that your faculty members have played in supporting student success? We are so proud of our faculty here in Morgan. And if there is uh, another takeaway from our experiences in this space, it is that 
the faculty must own it. The faculty really must own it. And um, while we have an incredible central office, uh, what I say to institutions in this space, and if I may digress for 15 seconds, in the space of inclusion in diversity, that you can't just set up an office and hire a person and then expect magically a metamorphosis to take place at the institution. So it has to be an entire cultural shift. But in this instance, our faculty here at Morgan really, really are leading the effort where it counts in the classroom as nurturers, understanding um, the brilliance of our students uh, and not coming into the classroom with, with um, uh, a bias is built in, uh, with implicit bias. Uh, and it's amazing what we found here. <laughs> uh, how much a small amount of money, how far that can go to basically say to faculty, we really do care about what you're doing. So we set aside a small amount of money, whatever, $50,000 or so, you know, that we squirrel together through grants and uh, philanthropic efforts. Um, and we give that to our vice president. And then what she's done is work with faculty to say, look, um, you know, we're gonna give X department Y amount of dollars, $2,000, uh, if your graduation rate increases in this department from X to Y, uh, and then you get $5,000 if it goes from Y to Z, et cetera. And so every semester uh, here, um, uh, we have uh, you know, what we call um, a powwow, you know, where it, all the faculty uh, come together, the department heads, and, and this, it's time now to check in and to see how well we're doing. Uh, and uh, that's when the uh, award announcements are made. And I tell you, I try and go to as many of those as possible. And I leave there saying, you know, I need to figure out a way in my budget that's already parsimonious, you know, to give $200,000 to that effort because the amount of celebration of that takes place over winning $500 and seeing your needle move department by department. So right. faculty is, critical in this equation. That's great. Dr. Frederick, um, since you took the reins of the presidency of Howard University, your graduation rates have increased between 20 to 30 percentage points. And amazingly, the university's four-year graduation rate is a hair below 60% which is unprecedented in the university's history. With very little difference between your Pell eligible students and those who do not receive Pell. So I have a two part question for you. Uh, many people assume that the only way to achieve that kind of success is to become a much more selective and much more exclusive institution. So if you could speak to your university's success in light of that uh, perhaps criticism that I sometimes hear. And can you talk about the culture that you have tried to develop on campus around student success so that it's student success first and everyone understands the role that they play in that effort? Sure, I, you know, I think two, two great questions. Uh, on the first part, um, yes, our admission criteria was something that we looked at. And not by our selection, but what I call natural selection of the student body, what we have seen is an increasing um, improvement in the academic credentials. And that's because we just paid more attention to the application process and then to our evaluation process of that application process. So our Pell Grant eligibility rate has not changed. So what I, say, what I try to say to people is that yes, if you look at the SAT scores, and that's a culturally biased test, I recognize that. And if you combine that with GPA, the number of advanced placement that students are taking, et cetera, it has gone up dramatically. But it is in a category of Pell Grant eligible students. And so what, what I try to convince everyone is that you still are taking students 
who are from a lower socioeconomic background, they just happen to be extremely bright. And that's not something that I think we should apologize for. What I think we needed to do though was to make sure we could support those students better. And that's what we have done. And so you're right, our uh, four-year graduation rate has gone up over 20% uh, since I have taken over. And really the, the majority of that success has probably occurred over a five-year period, which is uh, unheard of. But I think it started with that fun part of the process. And then the second part is the culture. I talk a lot about at orientation, um, parents coming back to pick their kids up in four years. Um, I suggested that if they want to come back in three years, we take that as well. And, and that speaks to one of the areas around the culture. We started looking at a three-year graduation rate. So I rarely talk about our six-year graduation rate now because I'm really focused on the fact that if we want to talk about cost, a lot of times, I think we're talking about cost over a six-year period. If you talk about cost and you talk about it in a four and three-year cycle, you immediately change the dynamics. The students who leave us in three years practically have, have saved 25%. And to show, um, I think to piggyback a little bit off of something that President Wilson said, we put our money where our mouth is. So we actually give students and families a 50% rebate of any direct payments they made to us in the last semester if they finish on time or early. And I can tell you, when I first started that um, as an incentive, we paid out $30,000. We graduated almost uh, from undergrad, well over 15, 1,700 students. And this last year, we paid out almost $350,000, I think. And so parents and, and, and students are emailing me as soon as graduation is over, asking you know, about what arrangements they can make to get your money. So the culture now is you have to get out of here in four years and three years. And the last thing I'll say is we also started creating programs to show that that was our incentive. So for instance, we've always had a BSMD program as long as I've known since the early 80s. We wanted a few uh, institutions in, in the country that you do three years undergrad, four years med school. And this year we started a BAJD program where you do three years undergrad and, and for his, and so it helps the whole ecosystem because we are decreasing people's costs, basically. Great, thank you, Dr. Frederick. And I have um, a couple more questions that I'd like to get through before we turn to questions from our audience. And so I would ask um, just one of you to answer this next question. We've spoken quite a bit about the role of technology and the fact that each of your campuses has implemented a predictive analytics platform. Can you just share some additional thoughts on um, the role that these tools play in supporting student success, not only at your campus, but other HBCUs and perhaps other minority serving institutions? And can you speak to the return on investment of these tools? because many institutional leaders have to make decisions about what to invest in. And perhaps this has not uh, reached a high priority level uh, given all of the competing challenges. So can you speak to the return on investment in uh, the predictive analytics tool? And I would ask um, any one of you to respond to that question, please. Well, uh, we, we think the return on investment we, we know uh, is significant. Uh, and so what the investment has meant for us uh, is that the data uh, that we can retrieve on our students is literally at your fingertips. Uh, we don't have to go to the Office of Institutional Research and have them run a report. Uh, that is there and it enhances the way we do academic advising. And so if through this process we are able to have a 2% retention rate, a 1% graduation rate, and you look at the overall tuition that those students are paying who are coming back and back and back, uh, the investment, if you will, is well worth it uh, because otherwise those students would not be on our campus. Thank you, Dr. Wilson. Um, I wanna get to audience questions, but I have, I have two questions that I wish I had time to ask. I don't think I have time to ask both of them. So I will ask a question that I know you often get. And that, ha that question has to do with the ongoing relevance and need for institutions like yours, historically black colleges and universities. 
for those that still might have some sort of uncertainty in their minds, how do you respond to the question, why are HBCUs still relevant today? And has your perspective in terms of thinking about this question become even more pronounced given the renewed calls for racial justice that are being heard across the world and the unprecedented support that we've seen as of late for the Black Lives Matter movement. I'll ask each of you to take uh, maybe one minute to respond to that question, please. Dr. Kimbrough, you're, you're, you, you've got a smile on your face. I'll start with you. I smile all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, so this is, uh, uh, Dr. Frederick will appreciate this. This is the analogy I, I use now. There was a report that came out from the Association of American Medical Colleges that said there were fewer black men in medical school in 2015 than there were in 1978. In, in, in 2015, there were twice as many black men in higher education, over 900,000 versus 400,000 in 1978. At the same time, 1978, about 20% of all black students attended HBCUs, less than 10% by 2015. So if you have twice as many black men, how is it possible to numerically have fewer that are in medical school? What happened? A lot of people ended up in places that were not a good fit for them. And that is the result of that. Similar statistics show up for people in law school as well. So when people say that, you know, they aren't relevant anymore, that means we're accepting that we've had people who are getting lost in higher education because they're in places that are not a good fit for them. Um, and so if we're going to accept that, then that's, to me, that's a larger problem. But when you use numbers just like that to say, how can you have almost 500,000 more black men in higher education and numerically have fewer in medical school with the assumption that these students are, are, are going to better schools because they're attending predominantly white institutions, th that shows that there is a, a huge problem there. So that's the analogy I use, and I use it with college counselors and foundations. And when you break it down like that, people have to look at to say, yeah, how is that possible? So that's the, that's the way I make the case. Thanks, Dr. Kimbrough. And for our viewers who may not be aware, uh, Dr. Kimbrough uh, implicated Dr. Frederick, who is uh, an oncological surgeon by training, and that is one of the statistics that he often cites. So, Dr. Frederick, I'm going to turn it over to you to respond. Sure. You know, it, uh, my, when I hear, when I get that question, I simply tell people it's not about relevance; it's about the significance and the outsized burden of that significance. Because to, to take uh, Dr. Kimbrough's uh, statistic a little further, if you look at the top 10 schools in America that send African-Americans to medical school, Howard is number one. There are three HBCUs in that top 10. And when you look at the number of school, the schools who send students from the undergrad campus to STEM PhDs, the top 10 schools that do that in America are HBCUs, of which Howard is at the very top. And Howard, over a 10-year period, sent as many as Stanford, MIT, Harvard, and Yale. So, so if, you, if you really want to diversify the workforce, if you really want to keep a, a playing field that has a, a, a variety of a mix of people, the HBCUs are not only significant, but they must thrive until somebody comes up with a different solution. And while I've heard people say before that if HBCUs didn't exist today, we'd have to invent them, Unfortunately, we couldn't because the, what they were born from and out of and the spirit that has captured cannot be recreated, but they can be enhanced if it's appropriately funded and resourced. Thanks, Dr. Frederick. Dr. Wilson. Yeah, I think this really is a misguided conversation nationally. Um, and uh, it is so unfortunate. Uh, that I think individuals hang on to the word historically black colleges and universities. And they, many of them, have come to believe erroneously uh, that our institutions are only for black folks. Uh, and as a result, they have allowed that belief to kind of work its way into a space where they're saying, well, why should we have institutions that only minister to the needs of black folks, which is not the case. Uh, HBCUs have never in their history said to students of other races, you can't come here. You find me another genre of institutions from the Ivy League to no league. Uh, 
uh, that can boast of that fact. It does not happen. And so in my view, um, uh, being the president at Morgan has, I, I guess I've been astounded as I've been on panels uh, where this question has come up. I can't think of another genre of institutions that has led to the kind of intergenerational mobility mm. as have HBCUs. That is a fact. And so what we need to be talking about is actually investing trillions of dollars into those institutions that are not experimenting. We know how to do it. We're not confused about what it means to take students where they are and move them where they need to be, to be in the upper class in this country. Uh, and then they provide, if you will, a path for others. And uh, I guess my last comment here, Dr. Howard, I keep this brief. I do have a definition of a new normal for higher education. And that new normal is that we'll have of the 11 HBCUs that are research to institutions that within the next eight to 10 years, the new normal should be four to five of them as research one flagship institutions in this country. That is the new normal that I would embrace and I would hope that the nation and uh, federal agencies that really determine uh, how you ascend research wise by uh, the research grants that they provide you to do the kind of research that you need to do uh, would also embrace that kind of vision. Very powerful responses from each of you. I can tell that's not the first time you've been asked that question. Uh, let's remember that we're talking about the significance and not simply the relevance of our wonderful HBCUs. So we have had a flurry of questions come into the Q&A box, and I'm going to try to spend the last 10 minutes to get to a few of them. The first asks you to uh, think within the context of the global health pandemic that we find ourselves in. And it asks, entrenched racism produces and sustains health, social, and economic disparities that have historically impeded the ascension of Black people in America. Historically, HBCUs challenged these systemic barriers by creating space that recognized and nurtured Black excellence. What does this look like? What does this work look like in the midst of our current situation, both the global health pandemic and renewed calls for racial justice? Um, you know, I think there, there are two things. Sometimes when I, when I listen to some of this debate, for instance, let's talk about policing uh, for, for a quick second. And sometimes people say, well, there's black and black crime. Well, you have to step back. There's enough data to show that black people are going to live closer to black people and therefore they're going to either live harmoniously with them or every now and then they're going to fall out. And the same thing, white people are more likely to kill white people because they live around them. That simple concept, if you extrapolate it to the flip side of that coin, which is black people are probably going to be more likely to help black people because they live around them. Our HBCUs create an ecosystem around them that can really help in some of these um, issues. And with the pandemic, the disproportionate impact on African Americans because of the health disparities that have so long existed, we can be and have been at the forefront of solving that. You know, Howard set up testing sites. Uh, you have Morehouse uh, securing a, a great grant from Morehouse Medical School uh, from HHS to look into this issue. You have um, Hildreth and Mahari looking at uh, research on um, antiviral agents. So the, the, the issue I think for us now is to recognize the power of the community that we have been built around and to make sure that we continue to provide solutions for them and not allow others to simply say that that's their problem or somebody else's problem or somebody else is going to come uh, to the rescue. And I think we, we, we have to. So I, what I say on my campus all the time is we have to start d exhibiting and expressing more self-love. And that, I think, is a big time solution for our way forward, whether it's in research or student success. Great. Thank you, um, Dr. Frederick. 
Dr. Wilson, a question has come in specifically for you. And it is around how you work with state policymakers to make progress on some of the student success goals that we've discussed today. Uh, uh, first of all, um, I, I have an editorial that's about to come out soon uh, where I talk about uh, it's time for the college presidency to be filled with presidents that are quote unquote woke. Uh, and I go into uh, a meeting about you know, what, what it means to be that. Um, and in there I say, it, um, uh, success uh, starts with this relationship with your governing board. I'm gonna get to the policymakers. And I said, for example, the chair of your governing board uh, should know what you're having for dinner before you know. That is how close that relationship should be. And I take the same kind of approach to lawmakers. Um, we're in Baltimore City, and we have a very strong Baltimore City delegation that is supporting Morgan, both as state senators uh, and as members of the House of Delegates. However, I take the, uh, uh, the uh, position that Morgan is for the entire state of Maryland. And every one of those elected officials is my constituent. And so I spend time with all of them in Southern Maryland and Western Maryland, uh, not just in Baltimore City. Uh, and they know every single success that we have here at Morgan, and we ask for feedback. And so that is the way I will respond uh, to institutions that are public. Um, you really need to make sure that all of those elected officials don't just see you during budget time. <laughs> you know, you have to spend some time going to wherever they are and introducing your institution and reporting on its successes and then make the case as to the return on that investment. And it, it can't be navel gazing. And so we brought in an external firm. We did one of these incredible analysis. And, and when I went to Annapolis and I would meet with them, and I would show them that Morgan's economic impact on the state every single year is $1 billion. Went, really? Yes, absolutely. You know, creating 7,000 jobs, you know, and, and producing X amount in taxes. You immediately get the attention. Because I'm not asking for an expenditure, mm -hmm. but an investment. And with an investment, you should expect a return. That's right. Thank you. Very much, Dr. Wilson. Uh, next question. Leadership takes great energy, passion, and commitment. What advice do you have for aspiring presidents and vice presidents to help them work through a system that doesn't always focus on ensuring student success? Dr. Frederick or Dr. Kimbrough, would one of you like to take this question? What advice do you have for aspiring, aspiring presidents or VPs? Well, you know, I'll, I'll say that a, a president can decide that that is important in terms of student success. And you come in and you set that as an agenda. Uh, I'm in my second presidency. When I was at Philander Smith, when I got there, our six-year graduation rate was 16%. And by the time I left seven and a half years later, it was over 40%. We didn't have a lot of additional money that came in. We, you know, we didn't lower our percentage of Pell Grant students. It was me just saying, this is going to be important and keeping it you know, out front to say, here are some things that we can do and people bought into that for us to get to that level. So I, I think that you, know, you have to be passionate about that and, and really you know, um, make a commitment that you're going to do all the right kinds of things to place the institution in the right setting. Um, Dr. Wilson talked about, you know, talking to the folks at Georgia State. I mean, here we had Tim Rennick come here to talk about things with predictive analytics as well, just to say, these are things that are very important and we can, we can move the needle, which I think is very important for us to do. So um, I think you can set, you know, that, that table in terms of what's important uh, and realize that there are lots of different pressures. I can't wait to read Dr. Wilson's editorial in terms of, you know, what that looks like because, you know, we are in a situation now where sometimes it becomes political and you have to sort of step out there a little bit more to get some things done. And 
Um, that takes a different kind of level of courage. So people have to think about that. So it's not just this romantic, romantic you know, I want to be the president. The, the question is, do you want to do the job of president? And sometimes those are two different things. And so that's why I tell people, like, do you really want to do this job or do you want to be the president? Because if you just want to be the president, then don't do it. Uh, so that's, that's the advice I would give. And we have time for one final question that is probably one of the uh, quickest hours I've experienced. Uh, but Dr. Frederick, I'm going to turn this one um, to you to answer, please. In light of the pandemic and the economic recession in which we currently find ourselves, we know that many students are struggling. Can you share any advice for continuing the trajectory of student success you've already had in the face of such trauma and stress that your students might be experiencing? Yeah, sure. I think that's a great question. It, it, no doubt it's, a, it's going to be a trying time. African Americans have been disproportionately affected. Uh, if you look in all the major cities, um, there have been more deaths at home um, than on, in the year previous, which suggests to me that people are either staying at home, dying of chronic illnesses, or dying of coronavirus and not getting to the, our emergency room. So what's gonna happen in our communities is gonna be devastating on the other side. And we see it already with an African-American unemployment rate of 17%, which I would suggest is probably even north of 20% because of undercounting. So all of those things are gonna be challenges. However, the resilience of the African-American in this country over time and the resilience of these issues in terms of offering an opportunity means that we will have a very gilded and golden generation that will be produced as a result of this. People tend to go to colleges to retool and re-engineer their skill set uh, during times like this when unemployment is down. Um, they tend to look for opportunities to uplift. And I think uh, the, 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 there's no coincidence that the pandemic and the racial injustices have now married themselves in such a way that we cannot speak of one and not the other. And so what I would say to students today is you have to stay the course. You have to find a way. We are going to try our best to make a way for you, but it is going to be worth it on the other end of this because I think the opportunities that will come out of this generation that goes to college now will change the world in a way that we finally needed it changed. I know I said that was going to be the last question. Thank you, Dr. Frederick, but I'm going to give you each a test to see if you can answer my very last question with a simple yes or no answer. So, uh, Mr. President, do you believe that the recent national attention on issues of equality and equity will lead to greater bipartisan political support for equitable funding and or increased private donations for your institution. Yes. Dr. Dr. Wilson? Yes. Dr. Kimbrough? Yes and no. <laughs> Dr. Frederick? It, it, it better. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So with that, I want to thank uh, each of our wonderful presidents for joining us, Dr. Kimbrough, Dr. Wilson, and Dr. Frederick. This is a conversation based upon the Q&A that I think could go on for another hour at least. So thank you so much for giving of your time today. I'd also like to thank all the participants that joined the webinar. And again, this webinar was recorded and will be available on the Lumina website. And I would encourage you to continue the conversation that has been taking place via Twitter using the hashtag HBCU leaders. Thank you very much and have a great afternoon.